All right, well, good morning. That's pretty good. Good to be with you this morning. I am, uh, I'm really excited to be here today and be with you. We are going to kick off a brand new series that's going to carry us through the month of July for the next five weeks. Call it Membership Promises. We'll talk more about that in just a little bit. Uh, it's going to be a little bit different type series. If you're new and uh, haven't been around TCBC very long, you know that normally we are in a book of the Bible going verse by verse, but the next five weeks are going to be a little bit different. It's going to be a little more of a topical series, but I think it's going to be helpful, challenging for us. And then come August, we'll jump back into 2 Peter, and that'll carry us through uh, the rest of the year. But this morning, we're going to talk about Really, let me just kind of set the picture of where we're going to be going for the next five weeks so you can have this on your mind and be thinking about this. Here's the question we're going to be asking, basically, is this. What does it look like to be an engaged, faithful member of your local church? What does it look like to be an engaged, active, faithful member of of a local church family. What does that look like from the Word of God? It's going to challenge us, I hope, over the next few weeks together to ask ourselves some of those difficult and tough questions. Now, let me switch the question a little bit and ask this this morning as we get started. If you had to say, if you had to answer this question, what would you say? What is it over the past few years of your life, your journey as a Jesus follower, what is it that you would say has most impacted, most strengthened, most shaped your life as a follower of Jesus over the past few years, 5, 10, 15 years, whatever it is? What would be that that shaped you most, impacted you most, strengthened you most? And I'll just have to answer that question personally. I'm not answering this question as Pastor Mike. Let me just for a minute. I'm, I want to answer this question as Jesus follower Mike. And I can say from the bottom of my heart that which has shaped my journey in Jesus really for almost the last 30 years. It's probably had the greatest significant impact in my life has been engagement in a local congregation. Involvement in the gift, the privilege, the responsibility, all that it is to be part of a local church. Personally, I am deeply grateful for the gift of the local church fellowship by which God uses to extend his grace wherein we grow in Christ's likeness and we walk alongside one another and we live on mission together. Man, I could not imagine my life over the last 15, 20, 25 years apart from engagement and connection with a local church family. This one for the last 11 years. See, it's in the local church. I'm just writing down some of these things that I'm so thankful for personally. It's in the local church of the past few years that I've, I have learned to love and I've learned to be loved. And that sounds kind of like a, that sounds like a Hallmark card. Let me explain what that means. In all my imperfections, in all my brokenness, in all my sin, it is the church where we're learned to be loved even though we're unworthy of love. It's in the local church where we're to experience the hands and the feet of the Lord Jesus and experience His love with skin on it. And where we learn to love others who are broken and imperfect and have all the bumps and bruises and sometimes, let's just be honest, just weird people, right? Sometimes we don't even like everybody. I get that. But we're called to love. It's been the local church that personally I have been built up into Christ's likeness. I've been discipled in the local church. I've been discipled by sitting under the preaching of God's word week in and week out. And sometimes I'm the one delivering the message and sometimes I'm the one who gets to sit under that message. But I couldn't imagine my life without the regular submitting myself under the preaching and teaching of God's word. I've been discipled by men and women who have invested their lives to help me grow in Christ's likeness. We talk about our discipleship pathway as a church as we're trying to grow in these disciple-making efforts, but I, I've personally been benefited by the local church of folks adding to my life and expanding what I know and restoring what was broken and Helping me grow as a disciple of Jesus. Couldn't imagine my life without the local church over the past 25 or 30 years. 
I've learned to submit to God-ordained leadership. The God-ordained leadership that is a gift to the local church. I, I personally have experienced the protection and the care and the oversight that comes from God-ordained pastors and elders. It's a dangerous place to be. We talked about this a few weeks ago. It's a dangerous place to be as a disciple of Christ, not under the protection and care and oversight of God-ordained pastors and leaders, and I'm thankful for that personally in my life. In the local church, I've been admonished. I've been corrected. Thank God for a community that loves us, and this is an area we need to continue to grow in always, but a, but a community that we love one another enough to call me out and say, what are you thinking? To call us out in our own self-deception and call us out in our own passivity and call us out in our own disobedience so that we will grow toward Christ's likeness. Thank goodness for the admonishment and the correction of a local church. And I'm thankful that in the midst of other brothers and sisters we have learned to put off the old man and pursue Christ's likeness and pursue a life of holiness that we have been called to. And in this local church, we're continuing to grow, and I've learned that the great commission of the Lord Jesus Christ to make disciples to the ends of the earth, it's not given to individuals, it's given to churches. It's given to communities. We carry that out together, this great commission of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I say all that, and then I, I came across this quote by Charles Spurgeon that I thought was so helpful when we talk about faithfulness and engagement to a local church. Charles Spurgeon said this, and I think we have this on the screen. There we go. Spurgeon said, if I had never joined a church till I had found one that was perfect, I should never have joined one at all. Amen to that. Good luck finding the perfect church, by the way. And then he says, at the moment that I did join it, I should have spoiled it. <laughs> hey, by the way, you ever find a perfect church? Don't join it because you'll ruin it. You'll spoil it. All of it. Spurgeon said, if I had have joined it, I would have spoiled it. Then here at the end, I love this. Still imperfect as it is, it is the dearest place on earth. The gift of the body of Christ manifest in local congregations, pursuing Christ together, living on mission together. Spurgeon says, the dearest place on earth. Now for us moving forward this morning, here's the question that I asked earlier and I want to ask it a different way and this is going to propel us into the scriptures as we, by the way, we're not taking a text and going verse by verse, we're going to be looking at a lot of different scriptures, so just kind of keep your Bibles open. But here's another way to ask the question we asked early on and it's, it's simply this, do you love your church? Do you rightly love your local church? And let me qualify that. I don't mean do you love everything about your church, right? That'd be impossible. I don't mean do you love every personality in your church? That would be impossible. I don't even mean do you agree with everything going on in your church? But here's what I do mean from a biblical standpoint. Do you have a high view of the gift of the local church because of what God's word says about the local church? Let me say that again because I think that's huge in our culture. Is your view of the local church shaped by what God says about the local church and not shaped by your past experience, good or bad. Not shaped by what the culture has to say about the local church. But is your view of this gift of the local church primarily shaped by what God's word says about the local church? Do you love and give yourself up for one another in the local church because the Lord Jesus loved and gave himself up for the local church we love the local church because jesus christ loves his church and we are willing to lay down our lives and give ourselves up for one another and be devoted to one another in this thing called the local church because king jesus gave his life for his bride and he lays down his life for the church and we do that because christ is in us do you love you love your local church. 
elders and pastors, we have a few goals for this series over the next few weeks. And here they are. They're quick, and you're going to continue to hear these. But here's just some prayerful goals for this series over the next five weeks. It's this, number one, maybe you're new. Maybe you're new to Tri-Cities, and I'll just say the next five weeks are great for you to find out a lot about this church, to find out if it's the place you want to call home, you want to connect. But here's the prayer. If you're new, the hope and prayer is that you will convictually and prayerfully determine that TCBC is your church home and you will fully engage. And let me add to that. If not TCBC, somewhere that's a healthy local church. That was a good place for an amen. Amen. Because we believe in the local church. It may be that you say, hey, TCBC is not for me. It's just not the place I want to call home. Okay, go find a healthy, God-honoring, Bible-preaching, mission-oriented local church and plug in. Even if it's not here. I mean that. So maybe you're new. Secondly, maybe you're on the fringe. (laughs) Maybe you've been orbiting around the perimeter of the church attending sporadically here and there, whatever it is, but you know you're just kind of orbiting around the perimeter and you've not fully engaged for a multitude of reasons. The prayer is you will realize scripturally, biblically, there is a call of God to engage and live faithfully as a part of a New Testament community called the local church. We don't want you to orbit anymore. Plug in. And then thirdly, maybe you're an engaged member. You've been here from the beginning, maybe. Maybe you've been part of a church for 30 years. You've been here for 30 years. But I pray as a result of this series and of walking through God's Word together, it will revive your active, diligent, pursuing love for your church. God, give us that. So that's kind of where we're going over the next few weeks. We're going to walk through something called our principles, our practices, our promises. I'll say more about that in just a minute. So we're going to talk about membership promises. What does faithfulness to a local church family look like? That's where we're going to go. Now, before I do that, I want to answer one more question because I know it's on the minds of some of you. And anytime you talk about local church, you talk about church involvement, there's questions that come up in your mind. Let me see if I can answer these biblically. Before we talk about membership promises, let's talk about what does the Bible say about local church membership. Pastor Mike, I I hear my friends and I hear a lot of people talking about, listen, we don't have to really engage in a local church. It's just kind of me and Jesus doing our thing. We don't have to have anything going with the local church. You need to be ready in your own heart to say, what does the Bible say about engaging with an identified local body of believers? And I want to give you five things really quick. These are straight out of the scriptures. You're not going to have time to look all these up. I'll give you the verse. It'll be on the screen. You can look these up on your own. I pray you do. What is scripture or how does scripture affirm local church membership? Number one, we have the example of the early church. Acts chapter 2, verse 41 and 42. I'll read this to you. It'll be on the screen. This is Luke writing about the early church there following Pentecost. And here's what he says about the local church. He says, so then, those who had received his word, Peter had preached the message at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit had fallen, the church was born. And here's what it says. Those who had received his word were baptized. They followed the Lord in that step of obedience of water baptism. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls added to what added to the local church the church global yes but practically the church local there in Jerusalem they were added to the local church what did that look like verse 42 they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer So here's a model, an example of the early church that they were committed to one another. They were living in submission to one another. They clearly knew that they they were part of this local family. They were not living in some nebulous zone out there somewhere. They identified with a particular body of believers in a particular place called a local church. Kevin DeYoung makes a great quote. I just had to give you this quote this morning. I thought it was really helpful. He says this. He says, the New Testament knows no Christians floating around in just me and Jesus land. (laughs) Believers belong to churches. Believers belong to churches. For all the reasons we said before and the reasons we're going to look at more. 
So the book of Acts in the Bible clearly gives us the example of the early church. Number two, what's another way the Bible affirms local church membership? Number two, the leadership of church elders and pastors. 1 Peter chapter 5, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain. Verse 3, not delineating over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. One of the gifts given to the local church is God-ordained pastors, elders, shepherds to lead, be examples, practice oversight, to care, protect, lead, and direct the flock of God. Listen, if you're orbiting outside the church, you don't have that gift of the protection of shepherds. I said this a few weeks ago, and I got in trouble for using the word sheep too much, so I'm going to be really careful this morning. But as sheep, we need a shepherd. You say, well, Jesus is my shepherd. Yes, but he carries out his purposes on earth through human shepherds, overseers that he set over the local church. Let me just say this as clearly as I can. It is a dangerous place to be as a follower of Jesus outside or drifting from the local church when you do not have the protection, care, of pastors and elders who will give an account for your soul it's a dangerous place to be some of you have a multitude of friends and family who they're orbiting in that land they're living in that nebulous area and i hope you have a prayerful concern and conviction you need to be a part of a local church call them to be in that place where they have this gift of the care and the protection and the guidance imperfectly yes but by God's design that there are shepherds and pastors given to the local church. Number two, example of the early church, the leadership of church elders. Number three, the responsibility of church discipline. The responsibility of church discipline. Listen to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 14 and 15. Scripture says this, And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the faint-hearted, Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. These are the dynamics that take place in a local church. There is the discipline that happens. We need the admonishment of one another. We need to be in communities where folks love us enough when we begin to stray, we begin to listen to our own thinking, and we begin to do what is right in our own eyes to love us enough to come alongside and say, Hey, bro, you're drifting Hey, bro, you're passive. Hey, bro, you're indifferent. What's going on? That is intended to happen in the local church. Apart from that, everyone is left doing what is right in their own eyes. And can I just say that's a dangerous place to be? Number four, quickly. The expectation of mutual edification. Meaning, in the local church is where we're built up. We build up one another to godliness and maturity. We invest in one another toward Christ's likeness that helps in the local church. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15 and 16 says this, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up. We are to grow up in every way unto him who is the head into Christ. From whom the whole body joined and held together by what every joint supplies and is equipped. When each part, where are the parts? You, me. When the parts are working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. That's the dynamics of a local church. Engaged, devoted to one another, building one another up. Again, another very helpful quote by Pastor Kevin DeYoung. Listen to what he says here. He says, when we join a church, we are offering ourselves to one another to be encouraged, to be rebuked, to be corrected and served. We're placing ourselves under leaders and submitting to their authority. Listen to this. We are saying, I'm here to stay. I want to help you grow in godliness. Will you help me do the same? Isn't that great? Identification with a local church and connection is to say, I want to help you grow toward Christ's likeness, and I need you to help me grow toward Christ's likeness. I'm here, I'm identified, I'm engaged, I'm plugged in. This is my home. The Bible presents that. Then fifthly and quickly, the Bible presents that the advancement of the Great Commission 
the events of the Great Commission happens through local churches. It happens in the local church. First Thessalonians 1 again says, For the word of the Lord is sounded forth from you. This local church there in Thessalonica. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth. Sounded forth is reverberate the, the gospel to go forth from there. That's to happen in local churches. The Great Commission is entrusted, yes, to individuals who are participating with others in the local church. That's God's grand design. Now, all of that, I hope, is a little bit for you to take, study those on your own, talk through those around your kitchen table, whatever that is. How does the Bible affirm being connected in a local church? We're just giving you some ways, okay? Now, part two, here's what else we're going to look at. What then does faithful engagement, participation, involvement in a local church look like? So here at TCBC, we have something that helps us with that, really defines who we are, where we're going as a church, and then what it looks like to be a faithful member of our church. We have something called our principles, our practices, and our promises. If you've been through DTC recently, you've walked through those, or at any point in the last few years, you've walked through those, but these build on one another. Our principles are these foundational things from Scripture that, that we stand on, things like God's glory. We're going to talk about that this morning. Principles like biblical authority and, and gospel sufficiency in the church, the body of Christ. We have these four foundational principles we're built on as a church. Out of those principles flow practices like abiding in Christ and gathering for worship and equipping the saints and go make disciples. We'll talk more about those. And then out, out of these principles rooted in scripture, we have what are called membership promises. That's what we're going to look at for the next few weeks. Membership promises help us take from Scripture and say, okay, here's what you can expect if you are an active member of this church, and here's what this church family can expect from you. We're imperfect. We don't keep per promises perfectly. That's not the idea. But it's to say, here's what I'm pursuing. Here's what you can expect from me. Here's what it looks like to be a faithful, active, engaged member of this church called Tri-Cities Baptist Church, okay? So that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at these membership promises over the next few weeks. Now, this morning we're only going to have time to look at two principles, God's glory, biblical authority, and then we're going to see these membership promises that flow out of those two principles that ground us as a church, okay? We're good to go? So first principle I want us to look at this morning is this one. God's glory. Principle number one that we're built on as a church, our promises flow out of that, is this, God's glory. Here's what that means for all of us this morning. We exist for Him. Amen? From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible is this message. God does not exist for us. We exist for Him. All things exist for Him. We exist for the glory of God. Psalm 19, 1. The heavens are telling of the glory of God. And their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. In creation, every planet, every star, every moon, even little Pluto that can't decide if it's a planet or what it is, is designed for the glory of God. All of creation exists for the glory of God. The idea of glory is something weighty, something of value, the worth or greatness of something. When we talk biblically about the glory of God, it means His infinite beauty, His manifold greatness revealed. As we continue to grow as believers, we have the Word of God to reveal to us God in all of His glory in the face of Christ, the manifold beauty and greatness and value of God. And when we see His glory and who He is, it puts everything in right balance. Watch, the universe does not revolve around you. The universe does not revolve around me. We exist for Him and for His glory. Isaiah 43, 7. Everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. 
Now I want to pause right here for just a second as we talk about this principle of God's glory and the promises that are going to flow out of that in just a minute. When we hold out the word of God from Genesis to Revelation and it declares the reality that we humans, we do not exist for our own glory, for his glory, you do understand that this truth flies in the face of our current culture's worship of the self and self-autonomy. The culture you live in, and by the way, left to yourself, you operate the same way because the most important being in the universe to you, left to yourself, is you. But our culture currently is, our culture currently is drunk on this idea of the self and self-autonomy and self-determination. My rights, my choices, my preferences, my freedom are prioritized over everything else. And when you come to the Word of God, remember, the Word of God says, to the contrary, you and I, we exist for Him. And by the way, that is the only way that you will ever find true joy and purpose and identity is not existing for self, but existing for the glory of God. You're created for that. We're created for that. Romans eleven thirty six 36 says, For from him and through him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever and ever. Amen, Paul says. A principle that grounds everything we say as a church is this idea, this biblical rock-solid truth. Glory of God. We exist for him. So then, if that's a reality, which it is, as the pages of Scripture tell us, then there there should be some actions, some promises to one another that, that really direct us of how to operate in the local church, how to relate to one another in the local church. So if we exist for the glory of God, then here are some promises that we have. Here are our first two membership promises that flow straight out of the glory of God. They'll be on the screen for you is this. Should be no surprise. We promise. Here's what you can expect from this church body to pursue if you're a member. We promise to do all as a church to the glory of God. In other words, the the bent of our lives and the pursuit of our lives and the way we make decisions and the way we go about everything in our lives is this, to the glory of God. If you're a member here, you should expect this church operates around Psalm 115.1, which says, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. It's not about a personality. It's not about a strategy. It's not about an opinion. It's not about numbers. It's not about what the culture is saying. It's not about will this work. We hope it turns out. Is this to the glory of God? It's what you should be able to expect as a member of this church. To him, Ephesians 3.21 says this, Now to him, Be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever and ever. Amen. You were born again by the grace of God brought into the church to glorify the Son who redeemed you by His blood. We live as a local church fellowship to the glory of God. The other half of that promise then is not what, okay, here's what I should expect as a member of this church, but then here's what the church should expect from you. What are you pursuing? Here it is. I promise to do all as a Jesus follower to the glory of God. In other words, again, this is a guiding principle taken straight out of Scripture. This is a pursuit of ours. What does that mean? Well, this all, where do you get that from? 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, ready for this? Do all to the glory of God. By the way, brothers and sisters, that's a guiding principle. That shapes every area of our life. As a follower of Jesus, there's no area of your life not touched by this reality. That means in every area of life, for example, let me just get really practical. It means it's a church we're saying to one another and we're devoted to one another. Help me, help us, us together, we're pursuing every area of our life. Things like this, Lord, am I spending my time for your glory or just to be entertained? Lord, am I pursuing relationships in a way that is for your glory? Lord, am I... 
Am I carrying out? Am I seeking this job? Am I carrying out this job for your glory? Am I operating at my workplace for your glory, for example? Lord, am I walking through pain? Not just to get on the other side of the pain, but to say, Lord, in the midst of this pain and this conflict and this hurt, Lord, glorify your name. Let me operate in such a way that whether I stay in this situation for the next 20 years or, Lord, you deliver me from it, whatever it is, glorify your name. Like the Apostle Paul, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Lord, you let me live for 30 more years, Christ. Lord, you call me home, I pray in death, you are glorified. That's the idea of we exist for the glory of God. Lord, am I honoring and glorifying you? Ready for this? Am I honoring and glorifying you, Lord, with my body? In this culture we live in, how important is this? That the glory of God drives this idea of how we see our own human body. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 says this. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? If you are a born-again child of God... Washed in the blood of Christ, the moment of salvation, the very Spirit of Jesus comes to live inside of us. Our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Keep reading. He says, whom you have from God and that you are not your own. You hear that? That will inform the way we approach even how we use our own bodies in this world. We are not our own. We have been bought with a price. Therefore, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20, Therefore, glorify God in your body. Lord, every part of my life, I do not exist for me. It is a painful place that will lead us to a lack of joy a lack of meaning a lack of purpose and despair if we think we live our lives for our own glory God in his beauty calls us to say no no you exist for me and my glory it's where we find meaning and purpose that's where we find delight and satisfaction How do we glorify God? One of the ways we glorify God, according to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 3, is that we delight in Him. Listen, if anything else in this world is your greatest delight, you are missing the joy that is glorifying Him by delighting in Him, being satisfied in Him, finding your joy in Him, your purpose in Him. We glorify God by delighting in Him. We glorify God according to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 by beholding the Son. And as we behold the Son, we are transformed from one degree of glory to the next. We become more and more and more like Jesus. And that is glorifying to God. Psalm 96.3 says we glorify God by declaring His glory among the nations, His marvelous works among all peoples. The motivation for mission is the glory of God. The motivation to share the gospel with your neighbor is ultimately that that neighbor does not know this great God and is not giving glory to this great God that is deserving. So we declare, we tell, we share, we preach, we teach, we go. Why? For the glory of God. So as a church... As members or potential members or future members of this church, we exist for the glory of God. Out of that comes we do all as a church to the glory of God and you. We pursue, we promise as a follower of Jesus that everything in our life we are pursuing for the glory of God. See that? That's how these membership promises flow out of these rock-solid principles that we find in God's Word. Now I've got one more this morning. We'll go through this quickly. So not only God's glory, that we exist for Him, that's one of our principles as a church. We we have a second one, and it's this. It's this principle of biblical authority. This principle of biblical authority. Here's how we define that quickly. It's this, that the Bible is the ultimate source of truth. 
that the word of God that has been delivered to us is the ultimate source of truth. Everyone operates on the basis of some authority, by the way. No matter how old you are, what your uh, religious affiliation is, it doesn't matter. You live your life on the basis of some authority. The authority of tradition, the authority of this is the way I was brought up. Here's the way most people operate. Here's the authority they operate under. Ready? And my family's going to laugh at this because we, we talk about this all the time. Here's the authority most people work on. Follow your heart. And we can even laugh about that. We see commercials about it all the time. There's songs that sing us about it all the time. Just follow your heart. What else can you do? Just trust your heart. Scripture says your heart will lead you astray. It is deceptive. And we are teaching to the next generation the lie that look for truth within and just trust your heart. And it will lead you to a place of pain and suffering and loss. But Scripture says, no, no, no. Ultimate truth is found outside of yourself in the inspired living word of God delivered to us. Bible is the source of all authority. It is the source of all truth. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God. It's from the very mouth of God. And it is profitable for teaching and reproof and correction and training in righteousness. So that the man, the woman of God may be adequate equipped for every good work second peter chapter one we're going to be here in just a few weeks but know this first of all that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation man didn't come up with this this is from the mouth of god that no prophecy was ever made as an act of human will but men moved by the holy spirit i love this spoke from god man A rock-solid pillar for you and for us as a church is this pillar of biblical authority. God's Word is the source of ultimate truth. Jesus said, John 17, 17, speaking and praying over His disciples and us, He says, sanctify them in the truth. And then He goes on and says, Lord, Father, He's praying to His Father, Your Word is truth. Jesus Christ said, your word is truth from the lips of Jesus. We get this principle of biblical authority. The Bible is the ultimate source of truth. Therefore, as a pillar that we drive down in the ground as a church, there are promises that flow out of that as members of this church that you should expect as being a part of this church that their church should expect from you as a member from this church that we're pursuing these things we'll give you one really quick we're going to wrap it up in just a moment if the bible is the source of ultimate truth then here's our promise we promise to affirm teach and adhere to the absolute authority of the bible in all matters If you're a member of this church, you should expect that as a a membership promise in this local fellowship. You should expect that the teaching, the decisions, the direction, the strategies, the ministries of this church are all submitted to the Word of God. Not to the preferences of men, not to Pastor Mike's favorite thing, not to some idea that we dream up, but ultimately we submit everything we do, everything we teach from what goes on here Sunday to every classroom, to every children's area, to every go group. Is it submitted to the authority of the Word of God? If you remember this church, you should come to expect that, call for that, strive for that. See? You should expect that no matter who breaks the Word of God on Sunday here, whether it's in any classroom or any format, that whoever breaks the Word of God in student ministry, go groups, wherever it is, that we have rightly studied, we've rightly prepared, and the source of our teaching is what God has said. Why? Because the Bible is the source of all truth. So in the same way, back to you as a member of this church, what does that look like? Well, I promise then, here's what your church should expect of you, to affirm and submit to the absolute authority of the Bible in all matters. 
that you're a part of this church, you're grown, you're discipled, you're challenged, you're encouraged to say, no, 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 the Bible has the final word. Scripture has the final word. Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. As a local church, we should be spurring one another on to give place to the scriptures in your life. That in your life, there's the study, the teaching, the reading, the memorizing of the word of God in your life. And we're spurring one another on to that. The word of God must direct us. 2 Timothy, we read it just a minute ago. So that the man of God may be adequate, equipped, equipped for every good work. It's God's word that equips us. This word equip means fully enabled to pursue a life of godliness. Fully enabled to carry out ministry and fruitful ministry in the lives of others. How are we equipped? The word of God. The word of God. I'm very quickly just chase something. I know our time's up. Is this... Okay, what if I live a life and I'm not submitted to the Scriptures? Well, then you're going to yield and you're going to walk to some things like uh, you're going to live under the authority of something like this. Mysticism. It's a dangerous thing, especially here in the South, especially in the Bible Belt. Well, God told me. Really? Well, God said this. God told me. And I'm operating under it. Do you realize that if you say God said something and it is not aligned with this perfectly whatsoever, you are breathing lies and you're trusting a false authority? Does God lead us? Yes. Does God guide us by his spirit? Yes. But any of those leadings and guidings of the spirit of God must be submissive to what is written. Be a slave to this God told me culture. Be a slave to this emotional culture that my decisions are made on the next impulse or the next feeling or if my day was good or my day was bad. Oh, we want so much more for you and for one another that we build our lives. We are not tossed to and fro by everything that comes along. We are built on the rock-solid foundation of the tested, refined, perfect word of the living God as a church. Amen. So our principles are this, we exist for him, God's glory. As a member of this church, we're, we're pursuing that. I want to ask the team just to come on up and begin to play. Don't, don't check out on me, we're not finished, but we're going to move into a time of response. The other pillar is biblical authority. The, the word is the source of ultimate truth, and we make every decision and ministry and direction on that. We're calling one another to live our lives submitted and yielded and Feasting on the word of the living God. And as we close and the team comes on up and just begins to play and we move to a time of response, here's, here's the last question I have for you. Sometimes you can hear things like this and it can just become a moral teaching. You say, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do better. I'm going to try harder. Watch me go. That's moralism. That's not gospel-empowered, spirit-driven, grace-enabled, godly living. Pastor Mike, how would we glorify God in all of our lives? How would we live in submission to the Word of God that we hunger for and we study and we feast on the Word of God that is our treasure? Ready for this? According to the New Testament, here's what we do. We look to Jesus. You look to Jesus. See, Jesus is in you if you're a believer. And when he lived his life on earth as the perfect man for us to look to and behold, we are conformed to his likeness as we worship him. In the book of Matthew, it says this, Jesus said of his own life, did did Jesus do all to the glory of the Father? Listen, John 17, 4, he says this, My Father, I glorified you on earth. I've accomplished all the work you have given me to do. I have glorified you. Jesus prayed this way, Matthew chapter 6. Pray then, he says, My Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Meaning, Daily prayer of Jesus was this, Father, glorify your name. Jesus. He submitted to the authority of Scripture. When Jesus was facing temptation in the wilderness, every temptation he faced, he answered it with, it is written. The Scripture says this. 
When he was hours from the cross and Peter was trying to dissuade him and everything was trying to pull him away from the cross, he said this, Matthew 26, 54, How then will the scriptures be fulfilled? In other words, how can I honor the authority of scripture if I don't follow exactly what my Father has called me to do? It is written. So we live to the glory of God. We yield to biblical authority first and foremost as we look to Jesus. And out of that shows us how to pursue one another as faithful members of a local church family. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for this word. God, we've covered a lot this morning. I pray and I trust you to I ask you, Holy Spirit, to bring these things to our mind and shape us around these things this morning for your glory. For your glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray.